Good afternoon. I'm going to change things up a little bit and uh, talk about a very difficult, very interesting course that over the years I've developed with colleagues and friends that students absolutely love. And you know why they love it? Because so many aspects about it are real. If you're in the field of anthropology or history, you've probably noticed that uh, when people hold objects from the past, they want to know, is it real? Or if you're in the field of biology and you show students some kind of a muscle or a bone, is it real? For some reason, even if it doesn't look like much more than a piece of mud or a tiny rock, if it's real, oh, it's a world of difference. And the course that um, I've developed has many, many aspects of reality to it. It's a forensic archaeology field school. It's pretty much a spin-off from a broader course that uh, went for a whole semester. But this capstone piece of the one course was so popular that I've changed it into a course that stands on its own that can run for just four weeks. So if you can imagine a course that only runs for four weeks, but students are learning how to be archaeologists, they're learning a lot about bone, comparative mammalian osteology, photography, drawing maps and floor plans, detailed, detailed excavation, all in four weeks. You better believe it's a hard course. But they are never bored for a minute because so many aspects of it are either real or a few are kind of scary, a few are kind of funny. So hitting on many, many, many strengths that students might have or interests, we're going to hook them one way or the other. So let me tell you how we set this up. First, you've got to have a good backstory. What we're doing is a mock crime scene, M-O-C-K, meaning that it's a uh, murder or maybe a suicide that somebody was trying to hide and it's going to be a shallow grave in the woods. So you got to have a good backstory for this so that you'll know how to dress up your victims. And your victims are going to be pigs that you buy at the butcher or from a pig farmer or from a slaughterhouse. You're going to buy yourself some dead pigs that weigh about 130 pounds. Why 130? Don't don't pigs get bigger than that? Oh, yeah, much bigger. But you're going to want to dress them with human clothing. That's part of your backstory. You're going to pretend that these victims are human. And the students know about this ahead of time. They know they're not going to be digging up humans. But they do know they're going to be digging up skeletal elements. And that there's going to be a story going on with this. They have a sense of anticipation. So with your colleagues, you sit down and you make up a backstory. And it could be, ooh, drunk driver accidentally hits person at the edge of the road and tries to hide the body. Ooh, wife comes home and finds husband in bed with neighbor and kills them both. Ooh, drug deal gone horribly, horribly bad. What was he thinking? or religious cult gone horribly, horribly bad. We must escape. But then, oh, we got caught escaping. So your imagination runs the wildest then. And you have to, of course, buy uh, clothing then that will match for this. And the most fun I've ever had buying clothing, and I don't, I unfortunately did not bring pictures of this, but the backstory was a teenager who got pregnant. So my friend who is built like me, she's tall, she's not real petite, she's not real slender, she's about my age. We're at the ambiance, the store for lovers, buying tiny little bras and tiny little thongs. And we're laughing so hard, the people in the store think we're drunk. And we're <laughs> afraid we're going to be kicked out. And we're laughing so hard, we're crying. And, of course, lingerie for men as well, depending on the backstory. Uh, different necklaces that might show ethnicity. Um, 
keychains that might show what school you go to, stuff that goes in the wallet or a tobacco pouch of a victim. We found if we want love notes to be preserved, we have to write them on paper and put them in a tobacco pouch and preserve them. If you don't put them in any protective slip, they will decompose. And that's the cool thing about this course. We don't know, the instructors don't know what we're gonna find when the students dig it up. Is that love note gonna be there? Sometimes it wasn't. That's okay. It makes it more interesting for everybody. All right, so we've got the pigs, we've got the backstory, we've picked the site where we're gonna bury them. We want um, reality. We want it to be a shallow grave in the woods because that is truly where many clandestine burials are put. And I'm going to teach them exactly how to find a clandestine burial the way that and a crime investigative team would look for this kind of evidence. I know how it's done, and I'm gonna teach them. All right, so we have to traumatize the pigs. A big part of forensics is learning to distinguish between blunt force trauma, sharp force trauma, and bullets, bullet holes. And of course, with bullet holes, you can choose guns of different sizes, ammunition of different sizes and it will all show up on the bones. What you do is you do a little bit of overkill so that you make sure. Uh, not only are there gonna be stab marks on the clothing, there are gonna be stab marks on the ribs and things like that. So we do all of this ahead of time, well ahead of time. And we do the digging of the shallow graves well ahead of time. And then one day it's ready to all come together. It's gonna to take a year ahead of time. It's hard work for the teachers, it's hard work for the students. So ahead of time, we are getting ready to plant the pigs. So there we have a pig in a pickup truck. The pig is from the butcher. That's why it's been cut open. Um, my husband, who is such a trooper, he helps dig the graves. and He always puts on gloves and, and helps with all the other things as well. Gun play, knife play, sledgehammers. And there's a little dog who's very interested in all of this. Little dogs are interested in this, so are blowflies. And blowflies are gonna be um, aiding and abetting in our decomposition process. Okay, so shallow grave, he's about ready. This one was drug deal gone bad. He's gonna have some bullet holes in him. And then um, I like to plant little distractors, red herrings they call it. There's the shallow grave. I've got some sort of bracelet around him, like March for Diabetes or, or whatever, you know, to make the students think maybe he had diabetes and maybe he didn't, you know? And then in this one, he was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, maybe this was not um, a victim of uh, a drug deal, although, although we have done that many times. I'm now seeing the little uh, voodoo thing I left in the corner. <clears throat> this was a religious cult thing. So I tied together a lot of um, chicken bones in a rib, uh, I mean, um, chicken bones in a ribbon, and put it uh, next to him as, again, a mysterious clue. I had other little packets of juju type stuff with him. And with the female of this uh, story, I had a, a, a severed cat skull next to her. Just get them thinking. And again, it's comparative osteology. Pig bones look different from human bones, look different from chicken bones. Already uh, flies are landing all over this pig. We're gonna leave it open, shallow grave. We're gonna cover it with hardware cloth. We're gonna put down heavy patio block and the flies can go in and out, in and out, in and out. And in uh, 24 hours, uh, we'll have maggots hatching. And in three days, we'll have what are called third instar maggots that eat most of the meat. So you have to watch really carefully. You don't want these bones tumbling out of order. We want it to look like an articulated skeleton when the students dig it up. All right, so faded genes, they're gonna decompose real well. So after 20 days, it looks like this. The clothes have faded. Um, the, um, the maggots have left. They do a thing called post-feeding migration. After they're done eating, they go away in like a river of hundreds of thousands of maggots. So I teach my students this too. 
And then I always have on site a fresh carcass. It could be of a, of a smaller pig, whatever. And in this, this field season, a deer had been hit by a car and died on my property. And I thought, well, good. They could watch what happens to that pig. You know, and coyotes were eating its haunches, but the, um, the maggots were there as well. And right when a local newspaper and a photographer were at my house, students came running at me through the woods. Dr. Spurlock, Dr. Spurlock, the post-feeding migration has begun. <laughs> Which was rivers of maggots leaving the deer carcass. And I was like, all right, good, good. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Very good. You learned a new word. Now come back to work. <clears throat> all right, well, this is before they dug it. But anyway, that was the thing about the bugs I wanted to not forget to tell you. All right, so now we put dirt on this, giving you away my trade secrets. Dirt on this, then um, patio block and, and wires, and we leave it alone for a year. And then the next year, they come. In, my, in many cases, it's my backyard. And I teach them how to find clandestine burials. I teach them how to do a survey where they walk in a line and they note where is the um, weird disturbances, the secondary depressions, clumps of yellow subsoil, strange piles of rocks. And they say, I think it's there. And I make them keep looking till we for sure find them. Then they formally set up test units. Now they're learning all the techniques of archaeology. But unlike my field school, where all I found was eight flint flakes, these guys are going to find a pig skeleton and all that juju I put in there, and who knows what else. Maybe there's something in his pockets. All right, so it overwinters. Right in the spring, I'll take the wires off, and new plants will come up. That's another indication of um, there might be a disturbance here. Maybe unusual plants will come up. Maybe the goldenrod will be four feet taller right where I planted that pig. So they get to work. I send them out with metal detectors if I know there's anything good to find. There was. Well, you know, shooting was part of the backstory in that one. <clears throat> and then um, this is a much younger pig, but I'm just showing you how shallow the um, pit is. It's very stained. It's very realistic. It's stained with decomposition fluids. This is the actual pig that... Um, I showed most of the slides of. So they've they set up their formal test unit. They're bagging everything by body part and by level. They're drawing maps. They're drawing floor plans. They're learning all sidewall profiles, all the techniques that you would pick up in a field school. I made that string grid. It's uh, easier to sketch in the, the bones that way. And then they tell me what they think happened. They wash these bones off and well, even before they wash the bones off, let me tell you one story. I, um, my back story was that I had put a fetal pig inside one of the um, homicide victims. And my student, she thought, oh, Dr. Spurlock, the stomach was preserved. Look, look, I, here's the greater curvature. I was her anatomy teacher. Here's the greater curvature. Here's the lesser curvature of the stomach. And I was like, oh, honey, that's some stomach. That stomach's got hooves on it. It didn't decompose very well at all. But anyway, there's always surprises for me and them. All right, so mapping, then back in the lab, washing the bones. And one time they're hearing a skull rattle. What's this? Oh, there was a bullet inside the skull. I left it there, didn't I? Yep, so they're finding out uh, the trauma, what's missing, what's not missing. They lay it all out. They compare it to um, human. And the very, very interesting thing about immature bones is that this is a femur. Okay? This is a left femur. And in an immature pig, the end piece here is separate from the shaft. The little head is separate from the shaft. The greater trochanter is separate from the shaft. I don't know if you can see that up close. Um, students are getting experience in comparative osteology and in juvenile osteology. These are all juvenile pigs. Each vertebra, this is the pig's vertebral column, each vertebra is made out of seven pieces that I let them glue together. 
So separate in an immature animal, separate in an immature animal, but part of the fun is putting it all together. Then they tell a story, what they think happened. And they do a formal presentation. And my God, they went beyond my expectations every time. One time they said, we think the victim was Caucasian and of high socioeconomic status. And I was like, really? <clears throat> Turns out my mother was a very fancy woman. My father got her everything she ever wanted. I was using her old clothes to dress the pig and her foundation makeup happened to be rather pale. I was like, oh my God. So they were always doing things like this. So they are delighting me and then I'm delighting them by dressing up the last day. Okay, so this is excavated now. It's all bones. I show up the very last day and I dress up as if I'm the killer. And if, if my colleague was in on the crime, sometimes we were co-killers, and one of my students here today has seen it, I walk into the classroom drunk, pretending I'm drunk, with a bottle of vodka and my shirt buttoned all funny, falling down, ogling the ladies, because the backstory was drunk driver hits young girl wearing miniskirt. So everybody's happy, the instructors learn, the students learn, but look how much they're learning in four weeks. This is just incredible to learn that much in four weeks. And then they've all succeeded on one level or another because it's been experiential and there's picky lab work, there's brutal field work, everyone's good at something else. And mo more than anything, you know how to excavate something like that, you know how to excavate anything. They are ready to help at crime scenes, they're able to help teach field schools, they've mastered many of these uh, very, very important techniques. All right, I hope I've convinced you, and thank you very much. <laughs>